Aloha and welcome to Your Heart Magic, an illuminating space where psychology, spirituality and heart wisdom meet. Here's your host, Dr. Beth Ann Kapansky Wright, the clinical psychologist with a mystic mind. Aloha, everyone. This is Dr. Beth Ann Kapansky Wright. Welcome to Your Heart Magic. Today, we are talking about my spiritual gifts are opening. Now what? And I feel like this question is such a fun one to explore because so often we focus on what spiritual gifts are. And I think there's a lot of interest around looking into something like, um, well, what does psychic sensing mean? Or what does it mean to be clairvoyant? Or how did somebody become an angel communicator? We kind of have this fascination with these gifts, but we don't often think about what if the gift hasn't been with an individual their entire life? What if it opened up in their lifetime? And it was something that they had to go through this process of feeling like a beginner and having to grapple with it and not knowing what was happening. And they were able to develop it. Um, Sometimes we can feel really drawn to stories like that, but we tend to have an emphasis on the gift as it is fully developed because a lot of times that person might be using it to create something or they're using it in service or some shape or form. Maybe they've created a spiritual business out of it, but we don't always talk about what is happening if those gifts are opening up and what might that look like and how might that feel and what are some of the things you might experience and what do you do next? If you have a gift opening to you, or you feel like something is developing within you, how do you get from a place where you are at the very beginning stages of it and get to a place where you might do something like create a business out of it or write a book about it, or even just share about it to relevant people in a way where you have some form of confidence or sense of um, kind of empowerment about it. So we are talking about today kind of the beginning and the middle of a journey as opposed to focusing on the end. And we will be looking at what are spiritual gifts? How can we understand them? How do we know when they're opening and what might that look like? What might the experience of that be? And then like, so what do you do with it? Like, what's the next step and how do you know kind of where to go from there? With that, let's dive in and see what wants to unfold and come out today. So starting with what are spiritual gifts, I wrote down a definition that um, actually came from the Akashic Records. I opened the records before I hopped on here and got a little bit of their feedback on gifts today. So some of that is woven into the content of this podcast. And their definition was spiritual gifts are latent tendencies that help the bearer open to receiving information in nonlinear and often sensory forms. By latent tendencies, that means that the potential is there, but the gift often isn't obvious. So when we talk about this idea of having a latent tendency, for many individuals, the raw potential of that might already be in them and they already have some kind of a gift or something around that. And yet, if you don't know that you have the capacity to do something or it's not talked about in your family of origin or in your school, um, which these things aren't usually, or in the spaces you grow up and in your communities, how would you even begin to know how to develop it? So latent tendencies is kind of like the raw material of something. And when I was opening the Akashic Records, the first image that I saw that was a beautiful example of a gift is if somebody had um, a ruby, but they didn't know it was a ruby. They had maybe picked it up on the beach or something like that and whatever magical land they're living in that there's uncut rubies just laying around. Um, And they had no idea that that 
gemstone potentially could be taken and cut and shined and like maybe turn into something beautiful and of value. They just thought of it as like their worry stone or um, the stone that they held in their palm or something like that. And I saw this ruby as uncut and a gift that the individual didn't really recognize the potential worth of what it was because they had not had anybody ever come along and say, hey, that's a ruby that you have. Oh my gosh, do you know how much that's worth? And if you took it to a jeweler who cut it for you and polished it, that would make the most beautiful necklace or something like that. If the individual wanted to have that, they might like the ruby rough and prefer it that way. Um, So sometimes the best way to think about a spiritual gift for many people is that the raw material is already there. But until they discover they're holding a ruby and have had it all along, or somebody comes along and says, that is a beautiful ruby. It's just an uncut form right now, which is why it's not as sparkly as what you envision as a ruby. They would have no idea. So that is a way to think of what a latent tendency is and what a raw potential is. And when it comes to spiritual gifts, there was this piece that said, um, receiving information in nonlinear and often sensory forms. So how do we know things? How do we receive information? Usually it is some kind of a linear fashion. I am communicating information to you right now through my speech. Um, We might receive information by what we can quantify, what we can measure, what we can touch, what we can taste, and like through the senses and the scientific method. So spiritual gifts are often thought to be something where the individual is able to sense, to perceive, to know some kind of information or data or knowledge about something through these very non-traditional means. And that usually is through some form of a sensory experience where they can feel what something might feel like, even though they've never touched it. Or maybe they can taste something or they have some form of a scent of something and um, they actually aren't tasting it and they're not in that space where they're smelling it. So there's many ways that these can show up. And examples of that might include um, clairvoyance. There's all the clairs. I didn't write them down. If you Google what are the clairs, there's plenty of information out there, but the clairs kind of break up like clairvoyance, which is um, seeing an image or having an image appear um, in your mind's eye, seeing pictures around something. I think there's like clair audio or something like that. And that's like hearing things, hearing a sound or something that isn't there. Um, You know, you could taste, you could smell, you could just know something, claircognizance, without knowing how you know it. Um, Another example might be somebody who picks up an object and from that object can sense the history of the object. Or maybe they pick up something that was owned by a departed loved one. And when they pick it up, they receive a message for maybe the owner of that object and receive this kind of psychic information or some form of a message um, to tell this person. Um, So there's many ways that a gift can take place and that we understand spiritual gifts Um, for the purposes of this podcast, instead of going into like this long comprehensive list of this is all encompassing of what a spiritual gift is, you know, let's just kind of work with the rule of thumb that it is being able to receive information um, in a way that opens us up to the energetic or the immaterial realm. Um, So we are somehow sensing energy, seeing something that somebody else might not sense or see. Um, All right. Why do we have spiritual gifts? I actually asked the Akashic Records this. Um, I was just really curious. They kind of laughed at me and they were like, why do any of you have like any of the talents that you do? Which I thought was a really good point. Um, It's interesting going into the records on spiritual gifts because we have grounded the language spiritual gifts to help us as 
humans in the year 2023 categorize and understand this kind of phenomenon of having an experience or having a talent for something that's a little bit outside of the norm of what might be taught in school and, you know, outside of the norm of something that just anybody could learn and teach themselves. Um, So we use the term spiritual, but, you know, from the records perspective, it's less of a spiritual gift and more of a gift or ability to receive information from the spiritual or the energetic realms, or they called it like the intangible and immaterial realms. Something again, that you can't touch or measure, but you know something or sense something or feel something without knowing how. So we stuck the label spiritual onto it, which um, isn't a bad thing. It helps us understand what we're talking about. But the records kind of laughed at me because they did not see spiritual gifts as this kind of superpower that only some people have and somehow it's extra sacred or extra something, um, or only certain people are awarded a spiritual gift. You know, that is all our very human hierarchical categorical thinking. Um, from the perspective of the records, many people have spiritual gifts. Some people are aware of them and are actively using them. Some people are in that latent phase where they've got the potential to develop them. And some people um, might not be interested in it at all. And that gift might be either manifesting in a way and they don't even think of it as a spiritual gift. Let's say they're very scientific and they measure and quantify everything. Let's say they're an atheist and they don't have any you know, room or anything like that for intuition. And yet they're still a very intuitive science uh, scientist who maybe follows their hunch or some of the ideas for their research um, actually might be coming from a little bit of divine inspiration and divine sensing, and they would never know, and it wouldn't really matter to their life path. So according to the records, this is not some extraordinary superpower thing. That is how we tend to think of it as humans. Um, It's something that many, many people have And when I asked them why, they said there's uh, multifaceted reasons that somebody might have a gift or a talent. Um, And again, why does anybody have certain gifts or talents? So it was a very broad question for them. But they said, in general, it is to help the bearer more effectively receive information that they will need for their life path and to embody the life path that they are following um, their soul blueprint, if you will, and that often that gift supports them somehow or supports their growth or their understanding or what they're meant to do or their purpose. And often that gift also comes into play where it's meant to serve the light in some shape or form. Again, that's just a general rule of thumb. So how do we know if we have a spiritual gift that is opening? We talked about spiritual awakenings um, a few episodes back and how to navigate spiritual awakenings. And I think there are some similarities between what somebody might experience or feel in an awakening process and what they might feel with the spiritual gift that might be opening. Because if you think about it, when a gift is opening to us, let's say the latent tendency is there. Um, that raw potential was in you and something happens that comes along that kind of takes that potential and bumps it to the forefront of your consciousness. Let's say it's been hanging out in your subconscious or in your unconscious mind. You haven't really been thinking about it. Um, And all of a sudden um, you start to have it more in the forefront of your mind. There are many parallels to the sense of disorientation that somebody might feel with an awakening or the sense of confusion of what is this, you know, and what is going on. And for somebody who is really dialed into the spiritual community or who's already spiritually curious and open to these things, that might feel really exciting. Like, I think my intuition is growing. Um, I love it when I hear people say that to me and maybe they'll tell me about a juicy dream they had. And then there was a parallel the next day where something similar happened, or maybe they'll tell me about 
a relationship or a friendship that they're in and how they just knew something that that person was hiding something or something was going on. And then it comes to light and they say like, oh, I, I just feel like my intuition is there. Maybe they're feeling extra moony and really drawn to the moon cycles and noticing that they're more like tuned into the new moon and the full moon. And around those times, they are more sensitive to those energies. So um, there can be some excitement around it and a little bit of fun. Um, it, oftentimes, if this is something that you already have a foundation for, it's exciting to think like, oh, wow, like this new gift or this new talent is opening up inside of me. And I think it's okay to admit that to ourselves. There are so many things in life that we don't always get excited about. And there's so many things in our day-to-day -day routine that um, sometimes don't elicit a feeling of excitement. Um, paying bills comes to mind or having to go to Costco. <laughs> At least that's that's like my nightmare is having to, to go into Costco and deal with all the people and bright lights and stimuli. So when something happens that's exciting for us, like, let's just give ourselves permission to get excited about it and to feel playful and to feel joyful. And that will actually support a gift opening up and us understanding it. But for somebody who doesn't have a good frame of reference for what's going on, or maybe they have dabbled in spirituality and they like the idea of it, but they don't see themselves that way. Um, oh, yeah, yeah, I read astrology, but like, it's not like I don't do astrology, like I don't really see myself that way, you know, or, oh yeah, I follow this like fascinating person and she does like psychic messages, you know, and energy updates, but I don't have that gift. Like I don't see myself that way. And all of a sudden you start having an experience where you know something without knowing how you know it, or, um, Maybe you sense something. Maybe you see lights flying around you um, and you don't know that that's angels or spirit or something like that. Or maybe you're out in nature and you sense presence there um, and you keep looking around being like, is there an animal? What is this? Um, and you have no idea that you're tuning into the beings of nature or the voice of nature or some kind of elemental or earth energy that... Um, might be unseen, but close by. Um, and it can kind of freak people out. Sometimes it feels really scary. We often like the idea of something, but when it actually starts to happen, it can really like scare people or freak them out. A lot of times they think, am I going crazy? Um, and this is understandable. You know, as a as a clinician, as a clinical psychologist, there is a whole section in the DSM five um, that is devoted to talking about bizarre experiences that people have, where they hear voices that aren't there, or have delusions and see things that aren't there. We have a bunch of labels for that kind of stuff. If somebody meets the diagnostic category, um, sometimes I just kind of will go down a rabbit hole of thinking about how many people in history might have had a diagnosis slapped on them. And what was really going on is they had some form of a spiritual gift and no way to ground that or understand it. Um, and without any basis for anchoring themselves to reality, they either looked like they were going crazy or psychotic, um, or they felt it, or they became convinced of it, or they became so untethered, they kind of lost their grip on reality. So sometimes there's a lot of fear around them and a lot of fear of, am I still mentally sound? Am I still reality-based? Am I just making this up? That's a very common thing that people might say, let's say they're really tuning in to signs and synchronicities. And they see lots and lots of angel numbers. But let's say they've been following angel numbers and um, spiritual numbers on Instagram or some online source, and they got a book on it, and now they're seeing numbers everywhere. And maybe they've learned that 22 um, is a number associated often with the angel saying, hey, my friend, you're going in the right direction. Everything is in divine order in your life. You're on the right track. So no matter how messy something looks or how 
what's going on. Like if you see 22, sometimes, um, you know, it is associated with like things are on the right track. Well, that person might start seeing 22s everywhere. And instead of just receiving, maybe that they're having this experience, a synchronicity where they are starting to see a number um, and maybe being able to receive that it's being shown to them or their attention's being tuned in for reassurance. Um, we are kind of trained skeptics. And so we're more likely to say to ourselves, maybe I'm just making it up. I read that book or I listened to that podcast or I just saw so-and-so's post on Instagram and um, maybe I'm not having this experience myself and it's wishful thinking. So we often get in the way of these gifts unfolding and opening. But let's say that we're able to kind of suspend that and we start to notice over time that these things are consistently happening to us and that we are starting to more and more see these areas in our life where we are experiencing some form of knowing, perceiving, feeling, sensing things without having a material reason why we know them. And we are saying, I think my spiritual gifts are opening. That, as I said, is when it might feel really exciting and it might feel very disorienting. And it might really make us question our understanding of reality. And like we talked about in the episode, navigating spiritual awakenings, where a spiritual awakening is more of a disruption in consciousness. And that can hit all sorts of things in our life, um, you know, from our identity to how we think about relationships, to how we think about purpose, to our health journeys. There's many ways that a spiritual awakening can happen. Um, and spiritual gifts can come from spiritual awakenings. But um, unlike an awakening, when it comes to a spiritual gift opening, it's usually a little bit more specific, where um, it's we start to have a disruption in consciousness around this gift and around how we understand our own abilities and how we might understand like who we are and how we understand the nature of reality. You know, what if you don't believe that any of this is real and you have a mystic vision where you are traveling or something like that and you go on a mountaintop or let's just say you go to a yoga class and you have this like very transcendent experience um you know during a healing session where you go somewhere in your mind or you have this very clairvoyant mystic vision of um a past life or something that's like really out there what do you do and how do you feel if you didn't believe in those things or you thought it was for somebody else? So there can be a sense of feeling disoriented around it and a sense of needing to establish a new basis of reality and just kind of this transition period of really reevaluating what is real, what might be possible. Um I had this disruption in consciousness around my understanding of either the nature of reality or maybe how I thought about God or how I didn't think about God or how I thought about the universe or spirit or the mysteries or whatever language we use to understand those things. And so there can be a sense of feeling confused, a feeling lost, a feeling I don't know what to do or what to anchor myself to, of wanting to kind of do like a, a mental check, you know, and make sure, am I doing okay? Is something going on with me? Am I losing it? Um, so that again, that sense of feeling in between something and being in this very nebulous space um, will often come when a gift is opening, where the individual has really no idea what to do with it and what comes next. And that brings me to our next part. Like, so what do we do with this? So let's say that whoever the individual is has kind of moved through the stages of rejecting it or being afraid of it or saying that was just a, a one-off experience. Um, and maybe it's happened several times or enough times that they're saying, okay, something's going on here. Um, and let's say that this individual actually wants to grow this thing. And, um, 
wants to better understand it or figure out how to work with it. They're on the spiritual path now, whatever got them there. They are like, okay, I got to figure out what this thing is and what it means for myself. And I need to understand like what this talent or gift is, or this new experience is that's unfolding in me. Um, so what comes next and how do we know what to do? And this is a space where a lot of people can have a lot of confusion because we kind of have this preconceived notion that if something is showing up in our lives, then there's probably a reason for it. And we want to know the reason. Um, And while there is a reason that the gift might be showing up, the reason might not be as linear as you think or what you think. Like a lot of times we feel like if something's showing up, we're meant to do something with it. Um, We're meant to somehow create something or produce something or um, share the gifts somehow. We are such a society oriented on doing and action. And it can be so foreign to us to think about step one is just being in a space of receptivity. And instead of thinking, what do I do with this and wanting to interpret it and somehow contain it and package it and make it into something, give it a label, Um, so that we have a sense of certainty, staying open and curious and saying, the first thing I do is I just receive whatever this is coming in with curiosity and with openness. And um, I just receive whatever it is that this gift is without necessarily having to slap an interpretation on it or say what it is. So that's really like the first step in the sense that that's the mindset that I think that we need to have. And I remember years ago, as my spiritual gifts were kind of growing, or I just had this interest, you know, and I remember I was doing an Akashic reading with the woman I worked with um, at the time. And I said, I feel like my spiritual, like my spirituality wants to grow. I feel like there's something more. And I did, I did feel an urging in me of growth an urging of kind of wanting to do something more. And I was like, what should I do? And the first thing that the Akashic record said in this reading was, well, if it's a should, don't do it. You know, and you you can hear it right there. Instead of how do I receive this? My first question was, what should I do? Like I wanted that concrete, like what's the next step so that I had a way to grow this gift somehow. And I was a little bit frustrated being told basically don't should on yourself. And if it's a should, it's not really coming from this like light place inside of you that joyfully wants to receive this gift. So the first thing we do is we stay open. And we maybe make notes in our journal. We have talked about keeping a journal to write down your spiritual experiences and your vocabulary of intuition and your vocabulary of soul. And kind of a journal is a great way. Like if you were a traveler and you were keeping a travel log and writing about these new cities you were experiencing, or if you were an explorer in uncharted territory, and you would maybe make notes on like what the climate is. And if you meet, um, you know, meet somebody there, say, or if find a new animal there that you don't have a category yet, you'd like write down, like, what does this animal look like without knowing what to call it? So we kind of start there with paying attention, being open, not labeling it, but just writing in our journal, our own observations and experiences of what's coming through so that we can start to ground and understand how it's showing up for us. Like if you are having a lot of things coming through in dreams and you're remembering your dreams and they feel connected to something that is happening in your life, or they feel like a premonition of some sort, um, I'm thinking of a friend of mine, her name's Virginia Mason Richardson, and she has this beautiful offering called the Magic Guide that she um, is very, very gifted with astrology and star stories. And um, it's just, I've known her about five years now, and it's really been a joy to watch her gifts grow. But I'm thinking specifically right now how she is a dreamer, and she often receives psychic information in dreams. And oftentimes that that psychic information relates to something that will tie into something she's drawn to in her day-to-day life or a synchronicity or something that takes place that 
gives her some form of revelation about what is happening in some of the bigger cosmic cycles and what is happening um, in more of a spiritual sense within the world right now. Um, and I've actually never asked her how did she develop this ability? You know, I'm, I know that she um, has had a, a journey to fully embracing her gifts. So I'm assuming she didn't start out having a dream and saying, oh, that was a psychic vision and knowing exactly what to do with it. You know, that's something that she had to grow and likely something that she had to really experience in order to understand what that is. But let's say that's you and you are having dreams and there is this uncanny um, patterning that you somehow see something that you dream or some kind of information in your dream that is showing up in your normal life, or you dream about somebody and they call you the next day and you feel like your dreams might be superseding, um, kind of the normal subconscious information and soulful information that our dreams will sometimes offer us to help us see into ourselves, but there's something kind of psychic or intuitive about them. You know, what do you do with that? Well, step one is write about it in your journal, you know, start to just stay open and curious and without having to interpret it, you create a container how to work with and how to understand your dreams. And that's step two is creating a container and starting to create patterns around the experiences that you're having. So let's say that you're having these dreams and you decide to write about them in your journal and you don't know what to do with them. Um, you know, you might start to make notes in your journal and you might start to see over the period of a month that um, your dreams have certain themes in them that they are about somebody else and then something happens in that person's life within a few days of you having the dream or that you know something and it comes through in your dream and then it happens or it's like a premonition where it happens um, within a few days of having your dream or within a month of having your dream. And maybe over a month you say, wow, I've had like three or four dreams that something happened that kind of came true from the dream. And maybe you had some other dreams that nothing came true. Um, that right there is your container to begin to help you understand when might your dream be psychically driven and something that has some spiritual material in it that is bringing you information. And when might your dream be more of a normal dream, um, I love dreams, so I don't know that there's any normal dreams, but a dream that has just been given to you by, um, I think, your soul to help you understand your journey and just to help you understand some of the themes in your life and the things you're working on within yourself. It would start with creating a container to study those experiences and creating a pattern around those experiences. So when we create a container and we start to create a pattern, I guess we're being good cosmic investigators, right? The Scooby-Doo of the cosmos. And we have our little spy glass on and we are trying to figure out how do we take something kind of otherworldly and immaterial and ground it in a way that we can study the patterns, that we can look at what are some of the commonalities and themes that we begin to see over time? Um, at this point, you might say, this is so cool. I want to learn more. And this is where it can be really great. Step three, to find a mentor or a guide, which could be a real life person who does. Um, there's some people out there who do spiritual and intuitive mentorship. There's intuition coaches, there's spiritual coaches. So that could be an actual person. Um, maybe your mentor is a body of knowledge and it's education. Um, I'm actually a really big fan of all of us, like just educating ourselves when we're interested in this because we're given our intellect and our brains to use them. So why not learn as much as we can? Knowledge is power and all that good stuff. Um, but yeah, maybe your guide and mentor is you buy a bunch of books on the topic and see what do other people have to say about this? What have they experienced? Maybe you find their work. Maybe they create something um, 
follow Virginia's magic guide. It's beautiful. She often talks about her dreams and her psychic experiences in, in them and weaves it into the full moons and new moons and what is happening within those cycles. I will put her um, information down in the write-up for this episode. Um, what a great way to say, I'm very intrigued by this gift. I want to learn more. I think I might have a few aspects of this in myself, but I don't know what to do with them. Um, you know, Follow their product, get a book, listen to a podcast, do something, access this material so you begin to nourish yourself and feed yourself and gift yourself the information that might help you put the pieces into place so that you can better understand the bigger picture of what you're looking at instead of feeling like you've got these individual puzzle pieces and you can't make sense of them. When we create a container and then when we start to bring in appropriate mentorship and education and resources, we are creating a bigger um, pattern for ourselves so we can see the fuller picture. And that's what helps us better understand what the gift is. All right. Step four, having said all of that at this point, understand that you can only learn so much about your gifts through somebody else teaching you. And at some point, your teacher becomes your experience of them. And this is perhaps one of the most um, challenging things, especially if something has shown up in your life that um, is not talked about quite so much, um, you know, some form of a gift that um, you can't think of anybody who's experiencing what you're experiencing or maybe talking about it in a way that resonates with you. So what do you do then? Um, There is a piece of this that you might be part of your journey might be to like come into your own understanding of it, to create some sort of a dialogue or gift around it. Maybe you're the one who in five or 10 years creates the thing that you can kind of offer to other people. Um, Maybe not. Maybe it's not meant for that at all. It's never meant to be an offering. It's just meant for you to learn or grow from. Um, But there is a piece here where we have to experience it for ourselves. And our experience is what informs us of the gift and not just our experience of the gift, gift. Really, the gift tells us about it. Um, And this is a little bit of a paradigm shift for many of us. We are used to um, educating ourselves and learning something. I mean, there's information at our fingertips, right? What do we do anymore when we don't know what something means? We punch it into a search engine. Um, I mean, we're just so used to that now and having instant information at our fingertips to see what Google says or Wikipedia or somebody else, you know, and whatever comes up in the top 10 of the search results, we'll kind of look at that. Um, So what happens if this knowledge or this information isn't something you can easily Google? You know, what happens if it is something that is still relatively new or there's not a large body of work around it or understanding? Um, You know, there's a piece here that we have to shift the paradigm and realize that opening to some of these ideas might call us to be the investigator of what it is. It might call us to be the cartographer who makes notes on what we're experiencing with it. And then maybe we match that up according to somebody else's work, or we um, pay for a a session with somebody who does intuitive work or Akashic work or something like that and say, I've got this gift. What am I supposed to do with this? What is it? Maybe they give us something that helps us understand it a little bit better. Um, But nobody can really come along and say, this is exactly what it is. And this is what you're supposed to do with it at least not in my experience. And I say that as somebody whose journey has been receiving spiritual gifts and opening to mine and moving to the island of Kauai with the intention of more fully accessing my gifts and then really going through that learning process of not knowing how to go about doing that and how to grow them and what to do and having to really learn in an experiential way without necessarily the information there in this black and white information guidebook or how to or something like that. So there is a piece here of releasing expectations about how it's supposed to look 
and just allowing ourselves to experiment and to come to understand the gift over time and to trust that whatever it is, that it will grow in its own timing. The gift will help us understand what it is in its own timing. And we will feel empowered to, if we're supposed to do something with it, to um, to do that in the right timing. Um, and usually if we're supposed to do something with it, I think it lights our heart up. Like we get really excited in our heart, even if it feels a little bit scary. And if we're not at that point yet, then probably we might be trying to interpret too soon or... Um, fear might be blocking us, but there might be times where we're not meant to do anything with it yet. We're meant to just become it and to learn to embody it. And we're meant to um, just get used to having it so that when it is time for it to grow, like we have fully owned it. Um, If you think about step one, where somebody starts to receive a gift, let's see, say they sense angels. This happened to me. Um, That started in uh September, October of 2017. Um, I wrote about it in one of my books. Um, I remember the first time that I started feeling angelic presence. I am sure I was feeling them before and just didn't know what it was. That is when I was very conscious of sensing them. And um, for the longest time, I didn't know what to do with it. So until I was at a place where I had a better sense that that gift was a gift that I could use to receive messages from others or to do a guided meditation that was um, angelically supported to offer support for others. Until I got used to seeing myself as that and understanding how to work with those energies and grounding it and creating a pattern around it, um, I wasn't meant to do anything with it. I was just meant to learn about it and to gradually embody it and to gradually get used to taking those first initial steps that did feel very scary to me when I started to, I think I made a YouTube video on it. And I think in an intuition course, I talked about it and I slowly started kind of bringing this information into offerings that I was creating. Um, before I ever felt comfortable calling myself an angel communicator. And it's still not really what I would call myself. Um, It is an aspect of something I'm gifted with, um, but I tend to lead with the Akashic Records. And that is something that feels even more grounded to me and even more comfortable. So there's a big leap from the beginning of something to when we get to a place where we want to share it. And there's a lot of really important steps that happen in between. I'm going back to what we talked about at the beginning of this episode of the beginning of climbing up a mountain and the middle of it and how much we skip all that stuff because it's not as fun. And we just want to know, how do you get to the top of the mountain? And what is it like to be up there? And we kind of look at people who are having experiences where they've arrived at whatever it is, but there is so much like good, juicy stuff that happens in the journey. And in order to fully embody a gift, we have to be comfortable owning it as part of our identity. And so there's a lot of weeding out of old fears and self-doubt and things like that that um, can sometimes get in the way of us ever feeling like we could step forward with it um, in a way that felt a little bit more transparent. And that doesn't necessarily mean publicly. It could just be in a relationship or with a close friend or a like-minded friend. Last point before we wrap up for today, and I just want to make sure I touch on this. If you have been listening to this and you say, this sounds really cool. I want to open to my spiritual gifts. I want to grow all this stuff. I don't know that I have any, Beth Ann. I don't know where to start. I think I've been forgotten about, or I'm one of the ones who doesn't have it. I want to tell you what the Akashic Record said and take us all back to that image I had. Um, when I opened the records of somebody holding a ruby, but it wasn't polished. So they had no idea it was a ruby. And the following image in the records was of, um, I can't remember the name of the TV show, um, but there was some show where people would bring like junk that they had in the attic, or they would bring antique collectors into their home and they'd go into the attic and find out this person had a painting by so-and-so that was worth like, you know, a thousand dollars or something like that. Um, and it was this idea on the show that for some people who were just collectors of junk, they actually had pieces of great value. 
in their home. And point six that I made was just kind of called like unseen treasure, you know, and it's this idea that many of us already have things that are of value. We just don't know it because we're really good at it. So somebody who's really gifted with gardening or cooking um, or music or art, or um, how about being a therapist and clients say to you, wow, you always say the right thing, or that's exactly how I was feeling. How did you know? Um, <laughs> this used to happen to me. Perhaps there is a gift that's there, like with our gardener, maybe they're like really gifted in earth energies. And even though they might not ever think of it as a spiritual gift, maybe they're not kind of spiritually minded like that. They just really like plants and flowers and have a good green thumb. Maybe part of them understands good earth energy and intuitively understands like how to grow plants and what medicines they need and can kind of hear a plant saying, give me more sunlight or I'm getting too much sunlight. Um, maybe the person who cooks intuitively senses how foods like blend together and how they might alchemize to create something really pleasing. And so they have this gift of intuitively feeling something that might combine and kind of come into together like a little potion, right? A food potion um, and be really amazing. And that gift could be used and developed into something else. Um, we don't always think about those things as spiritual talents. And yet many of them can be spiritual talents or there is a component there where somehow the person's just really good at it or they just know, or they've got some sort of a knack um, and they couldn't tell you how it's just always been with them. Um, there's often, I think, an underlying spiritual foundation where there's some form of a sensory information coming in that is not tangible. It can't be measured. They just know something. Um, so there's many people listening to this who already have something, maybe you're just really empathic or people tell you you're such a good listener or you always understand what I'm feeling or something like that. You know, you might be an empath who just really has the gift of feeling emotion and intuitively knowing supportive things to say. I mean, there's just so many ways that this manifests, but maybe make a list of what are you already good at? What are you drawn to? Um, what lights you up? Maybe you're not good at it yet. And by that, I mean, you haven't really studied it, but you've always been fascinated by astrology or the tarot. You've just never really learned it. Great. Learn that, you know, go build that knowledge base. Um, don't forget that education is part of how we can build and develop a gift. We can use our intellect. Not everything comes through with crystalline divine information where somebody wakes up one day and says, I'm an astrologer and I can suddenly look at a chart and understand all these lines and squiggles and hieroglyphics. Like teach yourself. And maybe something amazing comes from that where intuitively you start to see something that the relationship of the planets are telling you. So already you have value in areas that you might not have even considered. So start with what you're already drawn to. All right, that concludes our podcast today. Um, we We'll be talking next week about living with purpose and intention. I'm excited about this topic because a lot of people get really stuck on the idea of what is my purpose? What am I here to do? I feel like I have a bigger meaning to my life. What is it? So I want to really break down how can we understand purpose? Um, are there different kinds of purposes? Um, and then how can we live in a more intentional way. So we don't feel like we're wasting our time. Like even if we're not doing the thing that we feel like we've been guided to do, how can we feel like every day we are fulfilling our purpose and living with intention? So we are going to be exploring that next week. All right. Thank you so much for joining me today. And until next time, be well, be love, be you, and be magic. You've been listening to Your Heart Magic with Dr. Bethann Kapansky-Wright. Tune in next week for a new episode to support and empower your light.